Aloha, everyone. It's Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, and it's Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm Mitch Ewan, your host. And uh, our sponsor is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a program of the uh, University of Hawaii College of Social Sciences and financial support from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So I'm really pleased to welcome two guests today, Noel Marin and Christian Wong of the Hawaii STEM uh, Community Care Organization. And they're gonna be talking to us about air quality um, and trying to, I'm monitoring it with a, a CO2 device to reduce COVID risks. So it's really interesting technology. So uh, Noel and Chris Jan, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Mitch. Me. Great to be here again. So uh, Noel, why don't you uh, give everybody an update on uh, the, uh, the uh, STEM organization? Um, you have a variety of projects. We've had you on a couple of times. So tell us about the projects and bring us up to date on where you are so far. Yeah, uh, let, let's go with the, the first slide. Um, I'll do a quick intro on where uh, the, the organization essentially. So I just wanted to um, reintroduce Hawaii STEM Community Care. It's a coalition of Hawaii Island organizations and leaders that um, that is dedicated to finding innovative solutions to local problems. We formed last year uh, in response to the PPE shortage at the start of the pandemic. And uh, we have a, a number of organizations involved. Uh, Hawaiians, Hawaii Science and Technology Museum, uh, Christian's organization, Canada Friends Hawaii Telescope, the Success Factory, Pisces, Hawaii Space Flight, Laboratory, Sodakine, a, a local manufacturer, Seamless Productions, East Asian Observatory, UH Hilo, and, and also a local physician, uh, Dr. Craig Berger, um, just uh, among the uh, or, uh, individuals and organizations involved. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll um, take a look at the, uh, you know, the things that we've, we've worked on uh, during the, the past many months. As you can see, uh, our focus has been on PPE, um, uh, production as well as community empowerment. Uh, we've delivered face shields, face masks, comfort bands, dispensers. These are um, sanitizer dispensers, hands-free. Uh, we created door openers. Uh, we uh, built several UV mask irradiators, which we have ultimately donated to the uh, various fire stations. And um, uh, Christian here has also created misters for the decontamination of the uh, various, um, uh, you know, equipment and uh, fire trucks. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, emergency vehicle uh, vehicles that are that are used to transport uh, patients. So we have created so many different devices and uh, PPE in response to community need. In addition, we've uh, invested quite a bit of time with Kiki Heroes. I think we we talked about this in a in, in a past program as well where um, we, we, we've essentially uh, come up with so many different messages of empowerment for Keiki and family and uh, been distributing that material across uh, across the island. Actually, we're making it across the state as well. So um, it's been a very busy uh, several, several months and um, we have made great progress in terms of distributing these uh, uh, devices and equipment across the, across the island. Uh, oh, at the moment, I'm sorry, go ahead. Haven't you also had students involved in designing and manufacturing some of these uh, devices? Yes, yes. Actually, uh, with uh, with the STEM focus, we have involved students, um, different uh, age groups, uh, in the um, in the uh, creation of some of these devices, uh, and uh, and also the uh, the program Kiki Heroes. So yes, they have been involved. We we've made it a point to engage the youth so that in addition to delivering the value to our community. We're also um, uh, exposing our youth to the processes that are being used to come up with these solutions. So they're they're part of they're aware of the design process. They're aware of the iteration various iterations that are required to come up with some of these solutions. Now today, I would like to. I'm sorry, Mitch. Did you have any other question? I just want to uh, talk about your funding for the overall group. This is all donations, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, Hawaii STEM Community Care is an uh, um, uh, all-volunteer organization, so a number of us have just been con contributing our time, uh, but we've also be been dependent on um, donations, grants from other organizations to keep our operation going. Um, 
And uh, we continue to um, uh, appreciate and need these, uh, these donations. So uh, if anyone's interested, uh, you can go to highstemcare.org. We have a donate button on the, on the website and uh, that would be an avenue for, for contributions. Great. Yeah, so, so today I'd like to share uh, something, something that we've been working on since last November, and uh, Christian's been the lead on this. Um, it's essentially uh, what we'd like to do, share information about how a simple piece of equipment can be used to optimize indoor air quality. And we'll talk briefly about why that's important. If we go to the next slide, um, we are essentially uh, focused on enhancing or creating the awareness of the importance of indoor air quality. And this is really important because COVID-19, I think we all know now, can be spread through aerosols, essentially tiny particles that people exhale. And these, these um, tiny particles can actually linger in the air for up to three hours. And if there's someone infectious who has exhaled these uh, aerosols, it's possible for someone to, um, to be infected. So it's really important for us to be aware of the fact that um, indoor air quality is important to maintain. And uh, one way to do that is to ensure that there's proper ventilation. If, uh, if there's an infectious person who's walked into a space and there are infectious particles in the air, if there's proper ventilation, that can be quickly um, dissipated and diluted and reduce its you know, potential impact to others. Now, um, the question is, how do we measure? How do we determine if something, if, if air within a space is uh, insufficiently ventilated? One way to do that is to measure CO2 and uh, CO2 concentration in the air. And um, with that, I'd like to transition it up to Christian, who's been the lead uh, for this particular project. Hi, thanks a lot, Noel. Uh, thanks very much for having us today, Mitch. Uh, we really appreciate it. So yeah, um, basically how this started is, um, so I'm the director of the Hawaii Science and Technology Museum. We're a 501c3 STEM education nonprofit on the island of Hawaii. And um, in addition to that, um, until just recently, I was also a member of the Hawaii Fire Department. I recently retired in uh, December, but, um, for my last year of my career, I served on the county's COVID-19 training and education task force. And what our primary role in that was helping all these different businesses and organizations develop their COVID intervention so that they continue to stay open and serve the public and you know, continue to drive our economy forward while also at the same time protecting their employees and protecting their customers and the community in general. And so, um, through the course of that work, I came across this one particular article uh, about a gym in the mainland that had hired an HVAC engineer to assist them with their COVID interventions. Um, so as you can imagine, a, a gym is potentially could be a really uh, bad breeding ground for COVID just because it's enclosed. You have a lot of people exhaling quite a bit, um, typically not good air ventilation in one of those places. So they hired this engineer to help them develop um, those interventions and part of that was monitoring for carbon dioxide uh, and as basically a marker to kind of tell them if the air in their facility was fresh, if, if their ventilation was good enough. Because if you have a bunch of people enclosed in a room and they're all exhaling carbon dioxide, then naturally you would see the, the levels go up. And if you have good ventilation and fresh air coming in, then, then you wouldn't see that. You would expect to see the carbon dioxide levels to be about what you would see outside. Um, so what happened in their case is one of their trainers ended up getting COVID and tested positive. And this trainer, unfortunately, had been in contact with about 50 of their members. Um, but fortunately, because of all the interventions they had in place, including the carbon dioxide monitoring, no one else got sick, no one else got COVID. So um, they, they felt that they attributed that to making sure that they had good ventilation in their facility. Um, so we have, um, have that article as well as a bunch of other articles about the importance of air quality monitoring. We just put it up on our two social media accounts on Twitter and Instagram for Hawaii Science and Technology Museum. You can go read through those, those articles because they're, they're really useful. I think, um, 
you know, I think we're really onto something with this as far as it being um, one of the best interventions that we have right now to protect ourselves, to protect our community, um, in, in addition, of course, to the vaccines that are coming out. So um, basically to kind of talk you through it, I, I brought one of the uh, detectors right here with me today. You know, it's, it's a pretty fairly simple um, technology, but so normally when you're, when you're out and about outside, you expect the carbon dioxide PPM to be, you know, between four and 500, depending where you are. Um, and so what the HVAC engineer was using was a reading of 800 or less, I think maybe up to a thousand or less as um, a good indication that you have enough, um, you, your ventilation is good enough that hopefully no one will get sick. I do wanna definitely point out that this is by no means a COVID detector. I mean, that, that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is basically you're looking for a marker that is telling you if you have good ventilation. But that being said, hopefully that it's, you know, getting any, any germs, including COVID out of your facility um, to keep people from getting sick. So it's been a very successful project. Thus far, we have 30 units um, all around Hawaii Island. Most of we put them in schools. Um, we felt that that would be the priority because a lot of schools are trying to bring students back now. You know, we recognize that that the students um, need to have that social interaction. They need to have the face-to-face -face time with their teachers. So for us at Hawaii Science and Tech Museum and, and as a member of Hawaii STEM Community Care, we wanna try and we wanna try and help our community by making that process safe, as safe for the schools as we possibly can. And with this being one of the main interventions. So as you mentioned too, funding, I mean, we're very, very happy on and grateful Hawaii Community Foundation has been so, so supportive of, of our organization throughout this pandemic um, through their Hawaii Island Strong Fund, uh, which paid for a lot of the equipment that, that we've been putting out into the community. So um, many thanks to Hawaii Community Foundation and all your donors. We really appreciate it. Um, did you have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have, I, have several, I have several questions. So first of all, uh, how much do one of these uh, detectors cost? Yeah, so they run about a hundred dollars. Um, you know, it's not like it's not a super super precise instrument. At least the one that that we're giving out into the community, and we're giving these out again um, thanks to our donors. Um, but you can get them on Amazon. I mean, I'm normally not a big proponent of of you know. I, for me, it's all about buying local. But I I don't know of any stores that are selling these locally. But um, we bought ours off Amazon. Um, about a hundred bucks. They're, like I said, they're not super precise. You wouldn't want to use it on a hazmat call or anything like that, but it will get you in the ballpark close enough that, you know, you know, you can get a relative measurement that tells you, yes, my ventilation is good or no, it's not. So I'll give you a good example on uh, Black Friday, when I was still with the department, I went out to several um facilities when it was really really crowded and you could right away you could notice a, there was a big difference between outside readings and the readings that i was getting in particular um facilities um so it, it is accurate it, and it gives it to you in real time as you can see my numbers here are are moving right now so i'm just in this room by myself so the level's fairly low um but they're not they're not prohibitively expensive you know most most organizations should be able to buy at least one, and then you can take it around and take readings throughout your facility. So um, the other question I have is, where do you actually install it? I mean, do you put it up high, low, or like in the middle of a room? How do you, what's the best spot, and how many per room would you need? Is one enough for one room, or do you need several of these monitors? I think one is good enough. Um, I guess depending on the size of the room, I mean, if you're talking about a large warehouse then you would probably want more than one, but they are portable. You don't have to mount them. So you can walk around and, and like I said, take readings in real time. What I would uh, caution is not to put them low to the ground because carbon dioxide is heavier than air. So it'll give you uh, an artificially inflated reading if you put it really low. Typically I, I recommend people put it, you know, maybe waist, waist high level. Um, again, that's just anecdotally and, you know, Again, I, I do want to emphasize that this is not a COVID detector. We're, we're not making any guarantees, but it, think of it as a tool that will help you um, understand if your ventilation is good, which then 
should greatly reduce the, the um, possibility of having infections within your um, facility. I'd like to, uh, so, uh, oh, so go ahead. Yeah, Mitch, I, I'd just like to expand on that, that, that last point about, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, where it's actually uh, placed, you know, to, to take the measurement. And as Christian mentioned, you can actually walk around and uh, take measurements within a space, right? Now, I, I think like, and, and this would apply to classrooms or any um, occupied space, a restaurant, a bar, for example, you'd want to do it when it's occupied. So you can get a sense for what that risk is like when, when, the, uh, when the facility, the room, the space is actually occupied. And, um, and uh, Christian, you, you might want to just give an example, uh, like for that facility that, um, you know, without naming names, the facility that you visited, when you said it was really high, what, what was that reading relative to, um, you know, what would be normal? Yeah, throughout the store, I got 1,700 parts per million, and it never got lower than that. So, you know, it's significantly elevated. Um, and, and sure enough, you know, you can tell, kind of tell too, when you're walking around a place, if it feels really hot and muggy in there, and there's a lot of people packed in a, in a place, um, sure enough, you're going to get high readings in there. And, and I've, I've used this, oh gosh, probably over 100 times in, in many different facilities, and classrooms and that sort of thing. And I can tell you that that it's the readings match up to what you would expect based on the number of people in there. The other cool thing that I like about it too is that it, it gives you so much data from just one reading. So for example, um, some of the with some of the schools, um, you know, you may have eight students in a classroom sitting down and doing their homework and working together. Um, if you take those same eight students in the same classroom, but maybe they do a PE class and they're exercising and, and, and exhaling quite a bit, it's going to significantly increase the CO2 reading. Um, so it, it tells you right off the bat that um, for that particular activity, um, that space may be too small for that amount of people. So it's more than just telling you how many people you can put in there. It also gives you a, a guideline of what type of activities you can do with that particular number of people. Mm -hmm. So does the, uh, does the device have an alarm? Like, can you set a level and then it'll beep or do something or do you, so you don't have to constantly look at it? Uh, no, this particular one doesn't have an alarm. Um, so some of them do though. Probably could. Yeah, if you get a more expensive one, you probably could. Yeah, yeah, a, no a number of these have um, alerts, right? So if it goes over a certain threshold, you would get, a, you would get a, an audible alarm. The other thing that uh, I, is interesting is some of these also have data loggers. So you can actually have it placed in a space, like in a classroom during the course of the day. And you can actually receive, uh, at the end of the day, take a look at the data, how it changes over time. So you can get a sense for uh, what the impact is of certain types of usage uh, of the classroom on the actual um, you know, concentration of CO2 within the space. So you, uh, in a previous show, you were telling us about some of your air conditioning or air uh, filtration equipment uh, that you were also purchasing for classrooms to kind of filter the air. In this case, they're air filters. So how would this tie in with uh, one of those air filter units? Can you buy like air filter units that have a like a, have a a sensor like this built into them? So because they're all, they're always sucking air in. And if you yeah. put the sensor at the inlet, um, you know you could trigger it when the thing goes on and off. Yeah, you, you you're you're highlighting a uh, you know uh, hopefully an innovation or a, a feature that some of the uh, ventilation fan manufacturers or HVAC folks could could produce. Um, I and, and Christian, just for context, I came on this show with um, I think it was Richard, right, Richard, uh, Richard Ha, to talk about. Um, we talked about air purifiers and the, the, the role of air purifiers in uh, helping to increase the safety of a space. And, um, and uh, maybe, maybe the connection there, Mitch, might be more of what do you do when you see an elevated um, reading, right? What are the in interventions that one must do? So there's one thing, which is you, 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 you get the monitor, you monitor the space, and then you realize, wait a minute, this is too high. This is not ideal. So the question then is, what do you do? And um, there is a slide on uh, slide four, which just summarizes some of these things, right? So one of the things would be, uh, simple things to do would be to open the doors and windows, allow air to flow uh, through. Um, 
the use of ventilation fans. Um, now, you see this in bathrooms, you see this in certain facilities, but having one placed in a room that allows for air to be exhausted from the room, um, if it's necessary, it would be another idea. Uh, and then also moving activities outdoors. And some, some schools and some facilities have done this, right? Some restaurants have space, uh, outdoor dining spaces, for example. Um, moving certain, thing, uh, certain activities from indoor spaces to outdoor spaces would be yet another way to um, mitigate the, 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 the challenge. Limiting occupancy is another one. Now, what you mentioned about uh, air purifiers is interesting because in some spaces, you can't open the windows. Right, like some of the air conditioned spaces, uh, you know, you've got these uh, split units where the AC just circulates the air. It it, de it it cools it down. It takes away the moisture, but it just recirculates the air. If if CO two readings are high there, then the use of a um, uh, an air purifier, you know, a good air air purifier would be um, you know warranted, right, to reduce the risk. So. Um, it's like there, there's not one solution. I think it's just a combination of different things taken together. Uh, but the, the, the important thing is being aware that there's an issue. And if you're not measuring, you will not know right, yeah. to, to take exactly. action. Right. So how many air purifiers have you deployed? Uh, we have 30 out in the community. Uh, mostly there are schools. The schools are making really good use of them. Uh, they've used them. Uh, we've got a lot of really good feedback from them. They've used them to guide. Um, as a, as a way of telling if their interventions were working well or not. Um, a lot of the problem was that teachers would, you know, open their windows or open the door, but they don't know if what they're doing is enough. There, you know, a lot of them would say, oh, well, should I put a fan also? Do I need two fans? What direction should, the, should I face them? Um, by having a tool like this, it allows them to get a reading. So it gives them feedback um, if their intervention is, is working or not. Um, so yeah, throughout 30 throughout the island, uh, mostly at schools. Um, we also did give two to the um, the other members of the COVID-19 training education task force to help them when they go out um, to guide the other facilities as well that they visit. Um, very useful, very useful stuff. You know, I think I think this is really going to be key to protecting our community is is understanding the role of air quality monitoring as another intervention to protect us from COVID, especially, you know, it looks like, you know, there's there's these other really highly transmissible um, variants that are going around the island. So um, I think this would be very useful. One thing that I always tell people is kind of the Swiss cheese model, where you have all these different interventions and none of them are perfect. You know, you wash your hands, you wear your mask, you monitor your air quality, um, you take your vaccine none of them are 100% foolproof, right? They all have holes in them. But if you slap all those pieces of Swiss cheese together, eventually you have a pretty nice barrier that hopefully greatly reduces the chance of you um, becoming infected and, and the community, community spreading it. Well, you know, you guys are out there taking this initiative. You're out there uh, deploying this stuff. You're getting data now. And okay, so I'm gonna ask my question. What's wrong with the Department of Health and the Department of Education, they got millions of dollars stashed away in their bank accounts that uh, they're not using. And they have a lot of it's earmarked for COVID. So what does it take to get them to unlock the treasure chest and start deploying these things in mass? I mean, you guys have proven it's worked. You've got to deploy it. The teachers know how to use it. Like, what does it take to get off the dime and get this stuff rolling? No, that's a that's a that, that's a great question. <laughs> you always throw out these challenging questions, Mitch. Um, I, I think that there, you know, there are obviously many different approaches to addressing that issue as well. You know, there's a top down, and I, I think there's also this bottoms up, um, you know, approach, which is raise awareness for the, um, you know, uh, of the solutions that are out there, get it in practice. And, uh, and just continue to put the spotlight on it, right? As a, as a way to raise awareness and run it up the chain. So th that's at least one, that, that's our approach, which is to um, you know, tackle it at the grassroots level and do things like this, right? G getting on this program, sharing it with you know, an audience who hopefully will take note and pay attention and act is uh, uh, one way to accomplish it. There are obviously other uh, ways that uh, need to be addressed here from the top down. 
but um, I think that's above my my pay grade. <laughs> well, you're a volunteer. Your pay grade is like the highest level there. So uh, maybe you guys should uh, put on a Zoom workshop and invite all the high level decision makers and Department of Health and Department of Education to react. I'll spend two hours together to talk story and um, ask these hard questions to them. What does it take to get this yeah. done? Right now we got the clues. Uh, the schools shut down. Everybody's like afraid. Mm -hmm. And uh, these seem like low cost, uh, low, low, uh, but highly effective uh, ways to address this. And we're not doing it. We're just loafing along business as usual. Nobody's taking the initiative except you guys. And uh, the powers that be are like asleep at the switch. So we need to wake them up. Yeah, I, I agree with Noel. Um, you know, it's I think maybe what the problem has is just been is maybe just a lack of awareness of this as a potential intervention. Um, and so, yeah, you know, th that's why we're so appreciative that you guys let us come on here and talk about it, because the more we can get the word out, the better. Um, like for us, one of the next steps we're going to do is work with UH Hilo microbiology and see if there's a correlation between CO2 levels and an actual probability of you becoming infected based on the variants that we have now. Um, one thing I would ask your viewers, you know, whoever's on here or if anyone comes and, and reads the articles on our social media, um, if you think that this is a good intervention, call your elected officials and say, hey, I just saw this uh, on Think Tech Hawaii. Um, have you guys looked into this as a possible way to protect our community? Put it, you know, put the word out, talk to, to the people at your school, you know, your students, teachers or the administrators. The more we can get the word out, the better. Um, you know, like I said, I think it's going to be really important going forward to protect our community. So we really appreciate you guys having us on here uh, to kind of amplify this message. Well, I highly recommend you guys send this to all of your elected representatives, both at the state and county level, and uh, to get the word out. And uh, you know, they're going to hear me ranting. <laughs> so maybe that'll have an effect on them. I mean, they're all good people. They're all trying to do the right thing. And here's right. a pretty expensive thing to do when you look at all the millions of dollars we're throwing at this stuff, is mm -hmm. to set aside a few million dollars to put air purifiers in individual classrooms and other public buildings. It seems to me like a really low tech, uh, high, uh, high result uh, um, plan. Yeah. And this is not rocket science. I agree with you 100%. That's the beauty of this this particular intervention is that the technology already exists and it has been used in this sort of application in the past. Um, it's not like, you know, trying to develop a brand new vaccine. Obviously that, you know, that would be the superior intervention, but this is something that we can do right now. Um, again, it's just, it's just a matter of getting the word out to, to the decision makers, um, like you're saying. Okay. I'd well, like to, oh, go ahead. Mitch, I know we're, I know we're all, almost out of time, but just a real quick note. So the vaccine is out. We all know that. We also know that kids can't get vaccinated, and it's going to be a long while before kids get vaccinated. The other thing we know is that, at least in the U.S., it's a quarter of the population. And if we're talking about herd immunity needing 90 plus percent in, uh, you know, immunization, it's going to be a while, right? Therefore, we have to be vigilant. We have to continue doing what we're doing. And this is just one intervention, as Christian mentioned, that can help keep us safe. So with that, I turn it to you. Okay, well, we've got to sign off. 30 minutes just blew by like it normally does. So Noel yes. and Christian, thank you so much for what you're doing for the community and trying to keep us safe despite ourselves. And uh, this is Mitch Ewan signing off for Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>